this deployment, we actually cover, of the two nodes, the controller and the compute node, we containerize the compute node. So, okay, so going through this, uh, here's the, a little bit of overview of Triple O, so the first piece of this, of the two projects I'm gonna cover. So, really, you can think of Triple O, a lot of like this diagram, I mean, is, is OpenStack on OpenStack. Um, when you look at you know, this piece, you see the bottom piece. You know, this is what we call the undercloud or the install cloud. This is really a general use case for installing OpenStack that we do this, uh, that we find that you have a very specific cloud that, that you are geared to, that you know what it's going to end up as, you know what you're going to install. And you install that cloud so that you can really leverage the pieces of OpenStack, the APIs, that, so that you can actually install a more flexible cloud that you can configure so that you can hand off to a user. Uh, and so that second cloud I'm talking about, uh, the one on top, would be called the overcloud. So you can really just think of that as the user cloud. That's the flexible one that you are configuring, and that's your end goal. That's your target. So uh, the COLA project. The COLA project is actually a fairly new project relative you know, to OpenStack. It's probably only adapted into OpenStack maybe five, six months ago or so. And the COLA project is um, an Ansel-based deployment tool that deploys uh, containerized OpenStack services. So COLA um, has had a lot of success within the OpenStack community, uh, a lot of community growth recently. And the way it kind of works is it goes through two pieces. Um, there's the configuration and the deployment of these containers. Just like you know, any OpenStack service, you, know, you, you deal with config. So Ansible does both in this case. And the reason I'm pointing that out because we're going to pull out pieces kind of from Cola and we're going to combine them with Triple O, and they're each going to have a, a, a part to play in this. Um, specifically, the history of Cola, um, they uh, used to use Kubernetes in the past. Uh, Cola was a, well, it started off using Kubernetes, and we reached a point where it wasn't really feasible for us to continue, uh, for really the project to be a success. Uh, Kubernetes didn't quite have enough support for us to even deploy all the containers, like specifically Nova Compute just wasn't going to happen. Um, it did not have net equals host, pit equals host. Things like that did not, it wasn't available for us at that point in time very early, early on. So we actually moved to an Ansible-based uh, deployment method, um, and that's how we've proceeded then on. Um, that's something that we, I'll probably come back to and mention Kubernetes later on, because it's something that, that Cola could, in fact, come back to. Okay, so now for all the, the Docker folks in the room, you're going to really recognize this. And for those who are not familiar, this is the Docker file. And this is a, just a sample Docker file from Cola that we're going to use in this in demonstration. Uh, specifically, I want to draw your attention to the, the top line there. Um, and what's kind of important about this is that there's three layers, really, that are going to go into just this single OpenStack service. So this is the Nova Compute Docker file. So what's going to happen is layer two levels above this, we're going to have the OpenStack base container, which is going to have a series of packages that is going to be common among all the OpenStack services. So it's going to be you know, any, any generic packages that are going to be, that we can share, that we can store in this layer, that we, so we can layer it all the way down so we get the very simple Docker file by the end. So the second layer is the, the base layer. So you can see that at the top of the CentOS Nova base layer. That specifically is going to be a, a Nova service specific container that's going to have packages that's going to go across things like uh, that is going to be common among Nova API, no, uh, Nova Libvirt, um, uh, Nova Compute, all that stuff is all going to be stored in that Nova base container. So now we get to this point. So now we're at the third level here, this third layer. And now you can see how it's much more simplified. We, we're installing the OpenStack Nova Compute service. You can see uh, there's Open V switch and stuff like that. That's all here. Um, so as we move further down here, we get to Nova Compute Sudoers. This is really a, uh, this kind of is a way that Cola changed very recently. We actually wanted to run in the user space. So specifically, we actually run in the Nova user space. Uh, originally, we'd run these containers uh, with root inside. So that's something we've recently changed. Um, and the next is the extend start script. Um, this is a very important script. This is something that really makes Cola uh, consumable by external projects. Um, Really, uh, the, this is kind of draws to attention the two models that, that come with uh, when you want to configure containers. So the first one is config internal. This was a, an old model that Cole used to use. It's a very interesting one, um, actually, that Cole used to have. And what we do is we would we'd bake the config files 
or we baked the config files into the containers. And so uh, when you pulled them down, you, these services would come to configured. So then when you start them, they'd start up exactly the same every time. Very interesting model. But it runs into some issues, especially when you get to Neutron. Like you can imagine, Neutron has a lot of different configurations. So the networking piece into OpenStack. You can do it all different ways. It's highly customizable. So you can really run into the problems there. So how do you deal with that? Well, you're going to have to have lots and lots of uh, containers with baked in configs to handle all the possible configurations for this. So really, it became difficult for Cola to kind of manage this. So uh, we figured we'd move to a different model. So the config external model. So right now, this is what Cola currently does. Um, so what this requires is that you have a config generation mechanism externally. So this could be Puppet. Uh, in the case of Cola, it's Ansible. It really can be anything. You know, as long as you have a config file present on your host and you make Cola aware of it, you can mount in that, uh, that location of the config file into the container, and Cola will pick it up and use it. Um, so this really allows a lot more customization. This really allows Cola to kind of branch out quite a bit, because now projects can come in and be like, OK, well, you have your containers. You know, all I need is my config file. You know, let me try and run with this. So this kind of leads to the next point. Like now, we can combine you know both these projects that I mentioned. So kind of what you get what you get out of this is you now have a an undercloud with with Triple O. You you have those those OpenStack APIs. You have bare metal provisioning with Ironic. You have Neutron the networking there. Um, now you add that you pull out the containers from Cola and you add those into the overcloud, your, your user cloud now, you know, what do you get? You know, now you can leverage those, those bits of those, the containers and, and get the benefits of them and put them in your user cloud. And then on top of it, you still have that, those bits of uh, the undercloud underneath to really leverage those APIs and to really manage the whole stack. OK, so now we're going to look at the heat aspect of it. So the Docker folks, you might not be familiar uh, with this piece. Actually, sorry, no, this is the, this is the uh, let me rephrase that. So this is actually a Docker file. The next one will be a, a heat-specific uh, thing. This is one more Docker file. And this is actually the, uh, the marriage of what you get when you get the two projects combining. Because now we have two projects. And, and how exactly is, is OpenStack going to tell you know, Docker to do something? You know, what are we gonna, how is this going to work? So what we have is we actually going to get a container out of this. And the reason is, is because we specifically run uh, our containers on Atomic. So you're not going to be able to run that command OS collect config at the bottom you know, on Atomic. It's just not going to happen. Um, so how do we get around this? So we're going to put it in a container. So uh, what this container does is it, it, uh, it does the, the, it orchestrates the communication between Heat and, uh, and Docker so that we can actually bring up the containers that we need on this compute node. Uh, and the second thing that I, that I want to mention here is that uh, when I go back to the configuration part, because that's the one piece we're now missing. So the configuration is, uh, is also going to be handled through here. So right now, what we do is we actually run Puppet in this container. So Puppet is going gonna, is gonna to grab uh, any sort of metadata it needs from heat. It's going to run. Uh, it's going to generate configs. It's going to place those configs in a, in a location on the host. And then we mount in those directories from the host into the containers. And now while we have those configs on those containers. So that's kind of a, the whole uh, the process, of how this container really bridges the gap. So that way you can understand the flow from one end to the other. OK, so here's the heat template that I was talking about. Um, so we, even the Docker folks in here, you, can, you should be able to recognize at least a little bit. Like if you're just doing Docker run commands, you can at least recognize things like Docker namespace, Docker compute image, things like that. Like those are that's your namespace. You know that's where you're getting your your container from. You know, and then you look at things like Netico's host. You know, these are just flags in Docker. Privilege is true. Restart always. You know, and then we get into volumes here. You know, things like that. So this becomes very familiar. Although it's in a templated format, it's really just like a, almost like a Docker run command. So looking at the volume specifically, this is Nova compute. So we have we're mounting slash run. We're mounting lib modules. Um, and then we go down to that third one, uh, this directory, var lib se data json config. So this is a very uh, interesting one, because what this is is the way that um, the Cola container will be able to figure out what configs that you're giving it and where they should go. And so this specific JSON file I'm going to look into next. 
Um, so in order, just as I mentioned, so the JSON file is going to handle any sort of uh, direction and to where this, all this stuff ends up. And then that fourth one I'll go over following this. Okay, so <coughs> here's an example of JSON file. There's actually two. The bottom one's small because I just wanted to show a more complicated one because the Nova Compute one's a little uh, less complicated, but it's easier to see. So, you know, take your pick. Um, so in the example, we're talking about Nova Compute. So you can see the top there. Um, I ref we reference command. So command, this, this is uh, just a general command to start Nova Compute and referencing the config file um, that we want to actually use. So it also, what we have here is we have the destination of where this is going to end up. So at cnova, nova.com. Um, we also can set the owner, so Nova and the user, Nova is going to own this, and the permissions of it, um, and the source of where this is going to find it. So when we're mounting in that container, uh, from the host, which is varlib SE data, and we're mounting it to varlib cola config files nova.conf. So you can see how the connection actually occurs now. So the container's going to run, the script will execute, it will look, it'll look at this source, it'll grab that, it'll move it to etsy nova.conf, give it the permissions, uh, shown it, give it the nova user, and then it will execute this uh, command to actually run with this config file. Um, so if, if you can see the bottom part, you can see how this gets more complicated with Neutron um, and how we can have many different config files. Um, and so any kind of, like, you can imagine any kind of example, but we can really scale this out to be any sort of amount of config files you need. We can just mount in the container and we can move the configs around as necessary. Okay, so what I wanted to point out next was that fourth volume there. Uh, varlib etsy data nova nova.com. So that's was the one that uh, we were mounting. And okay, actually, yeah, sorry, I mentioned that. Uh, what I actually wanted to go to next is uh, the environment. So the environment field there. Um, this is uh, an interesting field because what you get here is you, there are two parameters for this called the cola config strategy. And right now it's set to copy once. So there's two things we can set this to. So copy always and copy once. What copy always is going to do is whenever there's a, whenever a container restarts, it's going to look to see if there are any config files there. And if they're there, it's going to take them and it's going to move them to, to Etsy, so etsynova.com, for example. So it'll move them to the desired location. So on copy once, what's going to happen is we're only going to do that when it first starts. So on the first attempt, those config files are there. We're going to move them to their desired location, and that's it. So every time you restart the container, it's not going to pick up any new configs. So this is kind of an interesting thing because this can deal, you know, how you want to, the way you can deal with updates. Say you want to change the, the say you just wanted a, you know, a different container, but you may have you know, another config lying around. You don't want it to pick it up. Or you just don't want it to even deal with this process. You can just do copy once. Or, you know, if you want to actually do this and you want the config to pick up each time, you can go copy always. You can move those configs around uh, however you need to. Uh, and last there. Um, the volumes from compute data. Um, so the, what we're doing here with Nova Compute is we are uh, mounting in, uh, or we are um, we're running it with a, uh, the compute, volume, compute data volume container. And what this is, is it allows us to uh, have another container that's going to remain around whenever we are changing out services. So specifically Nova Compute, if we want to uh, upgrade Nova Compute, we don't want to have things, uh, our data to disappear. We want to hold on to them. So we actually want you know, Docker to keep one of these containers running that's going to have a bunch of stuff mounted into it with a bunch of, that's holding a bunch of data so that, like, so, so in, for instance, we don't lose any VMs or anything like that. So that's what that is, and that's what it's going to hold on to. Uh, so specifically, this is what that looks like. Um, here's the, the creation of that container uh, in heat. Um, so uh, also, you know, very similar, you can see where it's coming from, the, you know, the container name we're sending it to, and specifically draw your attention to the volumes there. So Varlib Nova instances. Varlib Nova instances where, you know, uh, Nova's going to store those instances that when it, when it boots them, it, all that, that information is there. And the second one's Varlib Libvert. Now this is important for specifically Libvert, because um, if you do want to, you know, do an upgrade of Libvert, you really don't want to lose any of that data. So that's where we're holding it in this container. So this container is going to remain stagnant. It's not going to move anywhere. Um, and so this will uh, remain around. And we do also um, do a volumes from for the liver container also for this. So I want to talk a bit about the, you know, the benefits, like what we're going to get out of this. 
you know, what's important, you know, what's cool about, you know, just containers moving into this, you know, uh, deployment cloud here. And what I want to first talk about is, you know, compartmentalizing each service. And so now we're taking, you know, a service, you know, Node Compute, and we're really kind of putting a box around it. We are, we're dealing with it as an individual unit. You know, so anything we do to Nova Compute in there is not going to affect any of the services. So, you know, that can be really anything that you can think of. You know, whether you're, you want to, you know, change around some packages, you want to upgrade, you know, you want to update those packages in there. Whatever it is, it's not going to affect any of the services. It's not going to have any change whatsoever. Uh, so, second, the easy service rollback. So, for instance, if you have a, a failure, a failure with, um, you know, Neutron, whatever it is uh, that you have containerized, you know, how you know how are you going to get back? To what you had in the previous state. So one one way you can deal with this is that if you have you know if you have and you still have that container around than what than what you had before. So if you bring up the new one, and say you did an update of the you know a neutron, you know OVN, whatever you know whatever it is Nova Compute. You you update that piece. So you have a new container now. So how are you going to you know deal with that rollback? Well, okay, it failed. So I still have the other one around. I'll just kill the new one. I'll go back to the old one. That's not a problem. You can easily deal with this. Uh, and so finally, third and finally here, uh, we talk about updates and upgrades. Um, so some of the, the, the benefits that you get from this are um, kind of what, a little bit what I mentioned above. And uh, some of the you know, benefits between the two are very similar because, you know, especially with upgrades, you're still going to have to do database migrations and things like that. Um, but really just handling the services as single, single units does provide some benefits that I would talk about here. Um, so the general update workflow, this is just very, very simplified. And, and what I mean by update versus um, upgrade, update would be within a version of OpenStack. So, you know, you go from 7.1, 7.3 or something, and the update, you can go from 7.8. So a, t a different jump, it's a totally different process. Um, so we're just going to talk about the update here. So the general workflow, we're going to stop the services, and we're going we're to run a YUM update. So here's where things can become interesting, because we specifically run the YUM update. And then finally, we restart. So, what are we going to get out of this here? You know, first we're going to get the we're going to have Docker is going to handle the the service start and restart. So this is good. We can we can stick with this. You know, uh, what we've been using the whole time. We stick with just have Docker do it. You know, and it will uh, handle swapping out anything that we want to replace. And because we're now using Docker, we can use the service rollback here. Anything we have, if we can keep around, we can stop. Uh, before we start the new one, uh, or we can just have Docker replace it and, and remove the old one. Um, now, the YUM update, uh, specifically, you know, now we're dealing with, you know, uh, services being installed at build time and, and built at build time. So a lot of this, you know, the YUM update here is, is that now when we're, the YUM update is really done all beforehand. So we're not actually running it anywhere. So when you want to update something, you're just going to pull down that new container. So one of, the, one of the things that you can really avoid here is, is dependency issues. So I talked about you know, how the different layers of containers that we have to really kind of get this all started. You know, there are a lot of issues that you can avoid with dependencies between packages. If you specifically, you, know, you can think of a lot of different scenarios. You, can, you just want to update Nova Compute. You still have some dependencies across you know, the other pieces that you can still run into some issues you know, between packages that can cause this to break. Uh, so you can completely avoid that now with this isolated environment. You know, you can just pull down that new piece as you need to and uh, run that update. Uh, so the ability to mix and max service, so I briefly touched on it there. Um, this is something that operators I, I've talked to really, really like. Uh, so, you know, we just want one service. We want two services. We want half of them. You know, we want all but one. You know, we can, we can just do a, an upgrade of those services without having to really worry about, you know, too much of the issues here that we, that we would uh, be avoiding if we were just doing YUM updates. So now what kind of gets interesting here is that, like, you know, what do you, what, what do you want to upgrade? You know, how, how does it really, you know, all play in together? And, and this kind of enables, you know, rolling updates is that over time, you know, whenever it's convenient for you, you can run, you know, a single service update as you need to. So I need Nova Compute to be updated because I want a new feature. Okay, well, let me do that. I'll update to the, to the newest version. I'll go to 7.1 and well, the rest of my, my compute node is 7.0. Well, okay, I don't like it anymore. Well, I'll just go back to seven. I'll just go back to seven zero, and then if I need another one to be seven one, okay, well, I'll just go to seven one. So I can jump back and forth as I need to. Uh, containers really provide this flexibility. Okay, so the demo. Uh, so 
My demo, I kind of, uh, this is just kind of an overview of what I want to talk about. Uh, I don't think I have enough time to do the live demo. It does take uh, quite a bit of time to do, uh, but uh, I still have a video around, so we can just go through that. It's, uh, I shortened the, pe the waiting pieces out uh, so that we don't have to like sit and wait and watch text go by. So um, what I wanted to do is I kind of want to walk through what like a container update workflow would be like. But this is a very simplified version. Like what I'm trying to do is just kind of demonstrate that we have containers running in, in the uh, compute node. And I want to demonstrate how, how heat goes through and actually swaps them out for a new one. Um, and I also want to demonstrate the second thing, which is that you're able to actually mix and match services. So specifically what I'm going to target is I'm going to target node compute. And I'm going to give it a newer version uh, of the container, and I'm going to swap it out for the old one. OK. I think that's good. OK. So uh, on the side here, I'm actually just going to have a diagram, because I just don't want to lose anybody as to where we are in the stack. Um, so I'm just going to have, I'll just briefly bring it in and out um, so that we can just, so you can all follow along where exactly we are. Uh, so here we're actually starting on the compute node. Um, so this is where the containers live. So you can, should be able to see that. So we'll do a Docker PS here, and you can see what we have. Um, so just specifically to highlight some of them, uh, you can see there's the Neutron Open vSwitch agent. There's a Neutron agent. Uh, we have Nova Libvirt. We have uh, data container. We have the Open vSwitch. Uh, DB server, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, specifically, you can see that there are two containers that are that are pulling from that are actually pulling from the same place. The but there are two different names because they're actually they are different. It's just the config files going into them are different. So they have, they they have the same packages, but they're actually running different things. Uh, so lastly, I just want to highlight there, yeah, uh, the Liberty tag. So that's just the tag that I've used for this uh, to to identify. Nova Compute here, and I will show how it changes. OK, so next, uh, we are in the overcloud. Um, so we are now outside of that compute node. And we're actually looking at uh, the VM right now. So we have a VM running uh, that I just spawned up. I just wanted to show you that it's there. Because I want to make, sure make sure that you see that we don't lose it. It's still going to be there. OK, that went by a little fast, but you saw that it was there. <laughs> Um, OK, now we're going to go down to the undercloud. Um, down the undercloud, OK, so that you can see our stack deployed. Uh, so we have an active one running. Uh, so now what we do uh, with our deployment, actually, let's see, I think we're going to go into, yes, OK, so we're going to look uh, into the YAML file that actually drives this all. And this should pull a lot of this together. OK, so you can see here uh, what we're dealing with is uh, the YAML file. So you can see that there's the atomic image right there that we're referencing that lives in Glance. The Docker namespace that we're running with is mine. Um, the Docker compute image that we're using here. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of the Liberty tag and we're going to put in the latest, so different container. So, well, so really, this, this is kind of what, where this all kind of makes sense. So you can see where, this is where the containers are coming from. Uh, you can have, uh, this is the namespace, uh, this is, you know, all the stuff that, uh, that should really make sense as to where this all, where the pieces are actually coming from. And one of the things is you can, we actually have support for even local Docker registry, so if you do want it, you can run it in the undercloud, you can have your containers there, uh, and you can point to it, um, and you can run with that if you like. This is specifically not, this is actually going out to, uh, Docker Hub to get these. Okay, so we're going to save that, and... We're going to run the deployment again. So the command is exactly the same, um, and it's going to go through and run the update. And so Heat's going to go through, and it's going to figure out, OK, what changed in here? And it's going to actually make that specific change. So this, this is really the part. Um, I don't specifically skip on the screen, but this is kind of the part I'm skipping a little bit through, because this will take some time. OK, so now we are back on the compute node. So you saw here are our containers that were there before. So this is kind of where we do our little time skip, because now Heat's going to run. And what's gonna, what it's going to do, it's going to go in. It's going to look, OK, you just changed the tag for, for Nova Compute. 
used to be used to be Liberty. Now, now we have latest. Okay, so what do I need to do? I need to go tell Docker to change this out. So that's what it's going to do. So there's a little time skip as we moved ahead. Okay, so there it is right there. So we, we moved ahead a little bit, and this is where we get um, the node compute latest container down. Okay, so that is up and running, as you can see there. And then we have a new uh, instance in place, or new uh, container in place. Okay, so this is the, the, the stack complete. We actually did the complete update. We're back down in the undercloud now, uh, just kind of showing where uh, that this actually went all the way through. And so we're just going to show that create, create complete now, the update complete. Okay. So what we did, what we're doing here is we're actually going to go back uh, to the, I think I bring it up right here. There we go. Okay. So we're going to go back to the overclock here. Um, the point of this is really to demonstrate that that VM is still around. And what's really important about this is because the, the very unique case that Node Compute is, if you don't mount in those, those proper uh, uh, directories, this is going to be gone. Uh, it won't even be able to communicate to where, it won't be able to pick up where it left off. And that's very important. Um, so really, when going into the design of these containers, you know, can Node Compute and, and Liver were really, really the tricky ones because they, uh, they deal with the, you know, the situation and a lot of data being uh, left around that you need to be able to capture and pick up when you start again. Uh, specifically, libvert runs uh, with pid equals, ho uh, pid equals host. Um, so that it's a little bit different. So those two are specifically uh, very unique cases. Uh, I know Glance has a data container that you need to mount in, like var libglance images, I think. Um, and I think there's a few other cases, like Ceph is also a very unique one, as well as Cinder, also very unique, because you still need to access the devices on the host. So in order to do that, the container really, the wall between the container becomes a little bit thinner between the host so that you can actually access the right stuff so that you can complete the, the transactions that you want. Uh, so I will just do the new list. OK, so that was just to show that this, uh, that, that actually does remain around. Um, so just to kind of conclude, um, the, the Cooler project itself uh, is something that's really been growing you know, within the community, uh, within the OpenStack community, as well as you know, the Triple O project. And so the integration itself that has been very successful into the projects, uh, between projects. And there's really a lot, it's really open you know, to what you can do, you know, other projects you know, integrating with Cola, and, and really what you can bring with the containers integrating you know, into Triple O. Um, there's still a lot more technologies we can do. We can look at Magnum. Magnum uh, exists within the OpenStack under cloud that or it may not exist right now, but it's something that we can build into the undercloud that we can possibly leverage in the future. In the future, that's really one of the advantages of having that undercloud there is we can really get at all the OpenStack APIs. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something we can definitely look at, um, and also Kubernetes too. You know, Kubernetes originally did not supp uh, support net equals host, pid equals host, pri running and privileged, and which was just a no go for a lot of our containers. So you know, given that situation. Um, we, in the future, are going to look at Kubernetes probably again and within the Cold community as something that we can actually bring, bring back. And then possibly, in this case, we can actually bring it to uh, O uh, with our integration. Um, so with that, um, I think we've got a little bit of time left, so I can open it up for questions for anybody. I have uh, some cool swag here. If you have a really good question, I'll throw it to you. Anybody? Yes? You mentioned you have a separate container for persisting the complete data. Yeah. Uh, what, so what kind of code is done in the container? Um, so he, he, he was asking specifically, um, you said a container for, what was that again? For the, the compute data container. Yeah, OK. So, you, uh, so he's asking about the compute data container and what process really runs within it. So we actually, what we do is we, we actually just have it um, do nothing, really. It just sits there. The purpose of it is to uh, mount in those volumes. That's really where the value of it is. We need to have that container persist uh, with the information so that Nova can reconnect to all the VMs that are still lying around. So. Anyone else? Yes? Um, so, across, so specifically, no, uh, the controller node is a little bit different. 
uh, specifically in triple O because it does have pacemaker and there's a bit of different, there's, there's a bit of things that complicated a little bit on the controller note, but you know, something like that is, um, may vary a little bit. Um, so actually specifically, let me repeat the question. I, I was talking about, you know, you know, is it a Docker pull? Is that, you know, something that can do, you know, an upgrade or replacement, you know, for controller or compute nodes? So um, with regards to the controller, that's kind of what, what kind of what I was answering there. And compute, it's a little bit different. It's a little complicated. But um, really, you know, the, the improvement, I think, of this integration, I think if we adapt for other things, maybe like Kubernetes, it may change, it may make the control a bit easier. But you know, ultimately, if you want to do, you know, get a new container, a Docker pull is really was, that's, what, that's what it'll get you. You can also build it if you want to, um, but primarily, you'd probably pull it from a place for the people, the developers who've been building it themselves. So you know, that could be any range of versions um, that you want to get um, will be available to you. So. Yes. I'm sorry? Are we looking into containerizing under cloud? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the question was, uh, are we looking into containerizing under cloud? Um, so that was kind of a, a experiment, I guess, um, for a time. Uh, we're basically trying to look at you know, how, how small can we make this if we were to put this in a container. Um, and we actually looked at you know, having heat, ironic, you know, really the bare minimum pieces we had in a container and see if we can get it to work. We had some success with it. It was a, it was a little bit difficult, um, and then we kind of looked at even containerizing just you know each all the pieces and really just trying to get it to work. And so what I think kind of we've concluded is that if, to look at the containerization of the undercloud, I think the best place to look would actually be at the Cola project in which they 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 use Ansible to configure a, a just a cloud by itself. So what we could do is we could use Ansible in just the way that they use it to configure their cloud, and we can use that as the under cloud so that we can deploy an over cloud on top of that. So that's something that's, that's been kind of of interest. Um, it, it's, it, it's kind of an interesting concept because uh, uh, it would require integration kind of into the Colon community from Triple O, so it'd be a little bit different direction than this, but it's definitely something that we've looked into, and it's, it's, certainly, it's certainly possible. I don't know if I can reach you, but I can. Someone wants to throw it up to. Oops. <laughs> um, I'm out of scars, but I'd love to take good questions. Um, I can get you more scars. Oh, okay. We'll get more scars then. Yeah. yeah. The, so the whole business of keeping the container around in case you need to roll back, is that like something that happens by default, or is something that you use kind of control by a parameter or something? Um, so it's something that we would probably have to add in by a parameter, because currently, right now, um, the so it, it depends on the, actually the mechanism in which you go about doing it. Uh, specifically, the way we're doing it through Docker is that we're just going to replace them. Um, you can do different things uh, depending on the naming. Uh, if you want to have different names, so you can almost version them, you can have uh, Docker stop it and then um, start the new one. And then we can, you know, that, and we can handle that rollback that way. Um, you know, I'm not sure quite how Kubernetes would handle that specifically. Um, but uh, we could also do you know, just generally uh, having even a, just a stop command. How, how would we do it? Because there are multiple tools that you know this compose. It's just regular Docker, and Kubernetes, any sort of these things to actually handle, you know, container replacement and starting and stopping. And so we can go any which way. But uh, generally, right now, uh, within the templates, it does do uh, a replace. But we could have it sit around if we want to. Sure. Any more questions? You got another one. All right. Yep. Yeah. Like how fast is it? I mean, it's one of those ones. How fast? I mean, you can't really compare it directly because you have lots of controller nodes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, uh, if so, there's a few ways I can kind of go about this. Uh, you know, first, if you if you want to go through and have Docker, just do it. You know, right in front of you. I mean, it just takes you know a few seconds if you have that image in place. So now to kind of branch out, get a little bigger now. Okay, so now you need to have the image download and you have it have it pulled in. But which is most of the image is actually already cached. The layers, you know, Docker will have those layers actually already cached. So that's also not too fast. That's it's not, it's not too slow. So even pulling it's not too long. So kind of now as we get a little bigger now with heat, you know, heat still needs to signal all the way through. Um, the update piece, the the this is run compute nodes post deployment, which is one of the last things done. So it actually takes a while for heat to even signal over to it. So in general, it still takes uh, I don't know maybe like five 
five, six minutes to get there, but the actual container swapping out doesn't take long at all, or even the pulling itself. Um, so there's still ways that you can get around this, or maybe, maybe improve it a little bit, uh, they can imagine, but um, that's really what it, what it is right now, so maybe like five, six, seven minutes or so um, to really complete that cycle. Yes? Yeah, um, so specifically, Nova Compute's going to run privileged. Um, let's see, Neutron needs to, I think, I think Neutron, I forget which one needs to run privileged. Uh, maybe it's OVS. I don't actually know. Um, one, one of those needs to run privileged. Uh, Liver needs to run privileged. Um, I think that's, I think that's it. We, we tried to, to, as you made one more, I think, well, I know in Cola, I think Seth might. I know Cinder did. For a bit, um, yeah. Sorry, did you want to comment? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so specifically, the question is about Ceph block device and stuff. So I mentioned Ceph and Cinder because specifically when you get to Ceph and Cinder, these are very unique cases. I remember having to do these containers myself. It was very challenging because. Uh, you need to really go out to the host quite a bit to be able to w interact with these devices. So you're mounting in slash dev into the container. Now this was very tricky for Docker. Uh, for a while this wasn't possible, I think until 1.8 uh, slash uh, mounting slash dev was actually possible. So it took a while. And so, um, so specifically, you know, those containers compute with a Neutron one, Ceph, Cinder, and Libvirt are pr running privileged. Um, and there used to be more, but we actually kind of cut down on it, uh, especially as Docker improved, we've been able to actually cut down even more. Um, so hopefully there will be more in the future. Did I give you a scarf already or no? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> I just don't see it, so I was like. Okay, all right, well thank you everybody. I think we're out of time. Thank you for coming.